is now Mayor Mike Johnston. Tonight, the party has all of the usual pomp and the circumstance of which wealthy interests are paying for access to the mayor on his first day. A new way to get mental health help to people in crisis when police are called. Because in this type of job, it takes a unicorn clinician to be able to respond to these kind of calls. 100 degree days like this one are becoming more common in the metro area. Hold up though, before we blame climate change. And in a state where pets are often treated like children, plan to convince more young people to become veterinarians. Tonight, a next. Today we dedicate ourselves to two essential American ideas. That every problem we face is solvable, and we are the ones to solve them. Mike Johnson has never been short on hope. He will need it, probably some luck, too, as he becomes Denver's first new mayor in 12 years. If the path for Mayor Mike Johnson is anything like that of the men who preceded him, Federico Pena, Wellington Webb, John Hickenlooper, Michael Hancock, there will be challenges that he and we cannot even imagine today. Tonight is Mayor Johnson's inaugural party, first chance for wealthy interests to pay for special access to the mayor. It's, it's perfectly legal. I mean, shoot, practically tradition. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger is out at Union Station for this party. And Marshall, I know some people saw the mayoral race as kind of like two establishment status quo candidates in the runoff. And sure enough, some of the same business groups that were backing Kelly Bruff for mayor are now paying for Mayor Mike Johnson's inaugural party. Yeah, some familiar names are throwing money around after backing the wrong candidate for Denver mayor. Uh, depending on how much a corporation or association gave, you got tickets to the inauguration, specific gifts, perhaps VIP access here to the party, and definitely your name on a sign here. But what did the city get in return? Parties are not free, but the one being thrown in celebration of Denver Mayor Mike Johnston also is not being paid for with taxpayer money. It's being covered by sponsors at four different price points. Companies and associations that contributed $50,000, $25,000, 10,000 and 5,000. Several of these sponsors contributing money to Johnston's celebration wanted his opponent, Kelly Bruff, to be mayor. For instance, the National Association of Realtors is on the second tier of this inaugural party sponsor list, suggesting a $25,000 contribution. And yeah, it says Excel right below them. During the campaign, the National Association of Realtors gave $0 in support of Johnston for mayor, but gave a better Denver, the committee supporting Bruff, $471,000. Associated General Contractors, which supports commercial construction in Colorado, gave $10,000 for the inaugural celebration, but gave Johnston nothing during the campaign, while giving $47,000 to the committee supporting Bruff. Several of the sponsors have access to housing. Airbnb, Apartment Association of Metro Denver, Colorado Hotel and Lodging Association. I asked the mayor after his inauguration what the city gets for the money spent throwing his party. One of your top priorities was homelessness. These people paid to throw a party tonight. What are you going to ask of them in return to get to your solution of solving the homelessness problem in Colorado, in Denver? Yeah, uh, our belief is today is the first process of bringing the city together to actually get to work on the issues that are most important. That issue continues to be the most important. So we will ask everyone who was in attendance today, everyone who supported the effort today, everyone who watches at home on TV today uh, to be a part of the effort going forward, which will start in many ways with homelessness. But we didn't hear a specific answer there. Luckily, there's a news conference at 9 a.m. tomorrow from Mike Johnston for his first policy initiative, which might be about homelessness. And perhaps we'll hear how the people who paid for access here are going to contribute to solving that problem. So what is it? Why do you need money for a party, Kyle? There's porta potties. We've blocked off Wincoop here. And you got to have the sponsor Denver Vibes, which is the name of the organization. Denver Vibes crayons to color a vibrant Denver. This was on the back of the program. And we can also talk about, is it crayon or crayon? And the answer is crayon, just so you know. Yeah, no, I hate to correct you publicly on the air, but it's definitely crayon. And uh, my girls would <laughs> love this party. I mean, I don't know, I don't know how many five and two year olds will be in attendance, but my kids would love that. <laughs> I mean, this was at the inauguration itself, and I didn't see many kids, but, you know, here's the program, here's the back. I guess maybe if you got there too early and you wanted to do something to kill sure. some time, color the back of the program. All right. Well, if you don't feel like it's an ethics violation, please bring my kids those crayons. Marshall Zellinger, thank you. <laughs> Denver City Council has six new voices. Becomes one of the most diverse councils in city history. And city Council also now has two Democratic Socialists, up from one in the previous council. Notably, nine of the 13 seats on council are now held by women. Council President Jamie Torres joked today, that's enough to override a mayoral veto. 
It includes six Latinas, the most ever to serve on Denver City Council at once. And incoming councilors Chantel Lewis and Darrell Watson are the first two black out LGBTQ council members in city history. Denver City Council has its disagreement, sure, but it is nothing like Decono, where a famously dysfunctional city council just can't shake one of its two recently recalled members. He's not part of the group anymore, but he keeps showing up at public comment to offer criticism with a side of racism. Voters kicked Jim Torini off council last month. He was investigated for violating open meetings laws as the council majority pulled a surprise firing of the city manager. So Torini's not on council anymore, but he keeps showing up to talk at these things. He's a resident, so that's his right, of course. At a recent meeting, he blamed his loss on the lack of Spanish language ballots, said it was a violation of state law. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Then he launched an attack on a former colleague who's on council, and you can hear it just take the air out of the room. 30% of the population in the, of the Kono is Spanish speaking. And you're writing off 30% of the population by not informing them. Doris, I've done more for the Latino, my Latino neighbors than your token Latino presence on the council has done. I, so, okay, we'll set aside the racism. All the way. There we go. Uh, Trini's wrong on the ballot claim as well. So ballots at the county level, at the state level, they must be available in Spanish. It does not apply to municipal elections. Police are calling in help from a hospital system proactively before mental health emergencies happen. Our Mark Salinger explains how this could help law enforcement expand co-responder programs in areas where they've not yet been available. Each college campus is unique. But at CSU, there's something at the police department you can't find nearly anywhere else. We're not always the best tool to solve the problem. Jay Callahan is the chief uh, at CSU PD. His department runs one of the only co-responder programs on a college campus in the nation. When a call involving mental health comes into 911, his officers respond alongside a clinician. Each engagement that we have with our students doesn't necessarily have to be enforcement. The clinicians are contracted through a partnership with UC Health, and now that's expanding, giving more departments across the state access to mental health resources. I would like to see the co-responder teams grow, and I know our goal here for the UC Health team is that it possibly doubles in the next couple of years. Jennifer Fierberg is a clinical supervisor with UC Health, working with the co-responder team at the Aurora Police Department. At this time last year, the department was struggling to hire clinicians and hardly had enough to sustain a team. They've now responded to more than 1,300 calls so far this year. We respond on calls all day long of people in need of resources, in need of coping skills, um, in need of knowing where to go when they're in crisis. UC Health now has clinicians at six police departments across Colorado. They've responded to 5,000 calls this year, giving big and small departments alike access to a mental health clinician. Manitou Springs Police only has 10 patrol officers. Now it also has a clinician. We feel it is key to have co-responders with PD statewide to be able to respond to behavioral health calls. From there, they connect people with services instead of just taking them to jail. At the end of the day, this job is about service and we're here to serve our students. Money is, of course, always a factor in this, especially for small police departments. Chief Callahan points to a solution here by sharing resources. Police departments being open to having mental health responders for the county or even multiple counties sharing them would make them more accessible to more people, not just the ones who live in an area, Kyle, where mm -hmm. the department can afford to pay for them. So Denver famously has the star van. Aurora has the struggle bus. They've had some real trouble getting theirs up and going. Yeah, it's, it's, it's supposedly what they're telling us is that it's changing, and now they have data to prove that. You take a look at what they had last year. They weren't keeping track of how many calls they were going to. They weren't keeping track of which calls to respond to. There were a lot of programs. Then UC Health took over the contract at the beginning of the year. Now they've responded to something like 1,340 calls in the past seven months. So it's moving in the right direction. At least now they have data to prove that as well. When they can put the numbers in front of people, that's what changes the minds. When Denver was able to sure. put the numbers out and say this many calls, no bad incidents, that's, that's what gets people thinking. Exactly. exactly. All right. Mark Salinger, thank you. There are Coloradans who are soon going to move out of a homeless shelter and into a place of their own, and there's going to be a bed waiting for them. Part of a welcome kit from the nonprofit The Dolores Project. Welcome kits put together with your donations, just shy of $30,000 worth since last week. 
your word of thanks micro giving campaigns like that one for the Dolores project 161 weeks strong now raised more than 11 million dollars for Colorado's non nonprofits if you know of a need in our community even if you're not sure of which nonprofit can help with it if you just know of something that, that needs assistance shoot me a note next at 9news.com and we'll get to work trying to find a trusted nonprofit that's in a position to help we were like if not us then who they're taking upon themselves to make Colorado's veterinarians look more like the state they serve. Heat so hot, we had a warning today. For cities like Denver, this is becoming more and more common. That's next. Denver made a run at 100 degrees today. Got it downtown, didn't hit it out there in West Kansas at DIA where the official records are kept, but we could actually split the geographical distance to get more of a historical view on the heat. The weather station at Denver Central Park, so obviously old Stapleton Airport, has been there 75 years. Over the first 38 years, 1948 to 1985, it recorded 100 degrees 13 times. Over the last 37 years, 63 of those days. That is a 3 to 4x difference. While atmospheric warming is partly to blame, meteorologists also say it's the urban heat island effect. As cities like Denver ditch trees and grass and open space in favor of more and more concrete and homes, they trap more heat than surrounding areas. Danielle Grant, I'm springing this on you. We didn't talk about this ahead of time. I don't know if you saw, there's a fascinating article in the New York Times this past <laughs> week about scientists that have come up with like this new heat reflecting paint, this white paint. And the thought is that if they can make it cheaply enough, get it around the world in enough places, it could make a measurable impact on the heat trapped by the planet. That's absolutely that's, wild that just a paint could do that. That's phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, scientists, right? Yeah. They're geniuses. And if that can actually work and be implemented, wow, yeah. what a difference that could potentially make across the entire country, across the entire world too. Because yes, we have been looking at warmer days. This year, a bit of an exception. Today, our hottest day so far, 2023, 97 degrees officially out at DIA. Yes, West Kansas, right? But so far for the entire year, the entire season, we've only had five days in the 90s. J July 17th, 2022, last year, we had 28 days already in the 90s. So a bit of perspective. We were in the triple digits around Lamar, Pueblo, Trinidad, Grand Junction, Cortez. It was incredibly warm up in the high country too. And not just us dealing with the heat out there, much of southwestern uh, portions of the country stretching all the way through Texas and the Southern Plains states. Here around the urban corridor, we still have that heat advisory going until nine o'clock tonight, mid 90s to 100 degrees. We've already seen that and the temperatures are barely starting to cool off and then also in far south central Colorado. You'll notice those clouds starting to push back in for us this afternoon. Some gusty winds certainly evident on our satellite and radar composite. Most of the storms really not going to bring us much in the way of rain. As we go throughout the overnight into tomorrow morning, we'll kick off the day with some sunshine. We'll bring back the heat, but we'll also bring back the clouds and possibly a few thunderstorms that will pack a decent punch here in the metro area and off to the northeast. We are under a marginal threat for seeing severe storms. This is going to be just to the east of the I-25 corridor tomorrow. Temperatures may be a couple of degrees cooler than today, but still scorching hot with a lot of triple digit numbers coming into southeastern Colorado. Isolated storms return Wednesday, so do the 80s. Looks like a stormy afternoon, possibly some severe weather for us on Thursday, and then we warm up and dry out just in time for the weekend. Thank you, Danielle. Hey, may I make a recommendation? Something that is not from us, but it actually touches on a story we've talked about here a lot. When Denver Public Schools made the decision to fire McAuliffe International Principal Kurt Dennis when he disclosed details about the district safety policy, it sent a message. And a new article from Melanie Asmar at Chalkbeat suggests that the message came through loud and clear to DPS staff. She talked with district staff past and present who say they feel the chilling effect of Principal Dennis's firing. Yet they're speaking out anyway. This article is a deep dive into the school safety concerns that led Dennis to speak out, the circumstances around his firing, and it looks at why some of the data pointed out by the district does not support their reasoning for his termination. There's a link to that Chalkbeat story on our 9news.com. We started this program so that we can kind of show kids, you know, representation matter and they see us. Students of color face obstacles on their way to pursuing careers in veterinary medicine. A team of veterinarians is holding the door open for them. And there wasn't a whole lot that needed fact checking in Mayor Mike Johnson's first speech as Denver mayor. So why don't we just try the first line out of his mouth today? 
They call themselves the Critter Fixers. They've got a TV show on Nat Geo and a passion for convincing students of color in particular to join them in the vet business. Yeah, it's been really fun. Three and four. I get to see vets off of TV and do really fun activities. It's kind of you got it. Hi, my name is Nia Blackburn, and I am going into sixth grade this year. What we'll do is we'll test it to see if they test positive. It's to like know certain ways of helping animals and just knowing more. If you had animals at home and you didn't know what to do, it's kind of like you could just go home and help them out. 22, 23, 24. It's always amazing to get the kids together and do what we call Vet for a Day. Hi, I'm Dr. Bernard Hodges with Critter Fixes. I'm here with Vet for a Day and the AVMA. Okay. Wrap it this way. We've always had a, a little issue with diversity in veterinary medicine. You know, I mean, you know, blacks make up less than 2% of uh, veterinarians. So we started this program so that we can kind of show kids, you know, representation matter. And they see us, they see us on TV. They're like, hey, I want to be like these guys. So they get to know that they too can become veterinarians. So that's how we use this as a cage side or, or uh, exam room type test. They're learning how to test for heartworms. They're also learning CPR, learning exactly how to revive a dog, also suture stations, as well as ultrasounds. They're actually getting to touch and see exactly what it's like to become a veterinarian. Everything is totally free. They get stethoscope, they get book bags, they get lunch, they get t-shirts, they get to be exposed to the critter fixes. It's just an all around amazing event. If you were to know something like this and you were asked for this, you can always say in the future, like you can just remember it. Now they get to see and touch and feel and know they can do it. And so that's what I want every kid to walk away with. This dream is very possible. And they're taking the show on the road. Denver's one stop on their 15 city tour this summer. Denver Mayor Mike Johnson's inaugural speech was limited in specific policy proposals and factual claims. It was mostly the big picture stuff that you would expect to hear in an inaugural. Not the sort of thing that we put to the truth test, but of course, Marshall Zellinger can't help himself. I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> Just starting. The first thing Mike Johnston said after being sworn in as mayor is a fact. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. Marshall was going to make that his entire workday today, and we said, no, Marshall, you need to go cover the inaugural parade, too. Hey, here's your feedback. That's next. Some tourists. Hoping it through bookstores in Estes Park is the most Colorado thing we saw today. Earlier this month, viewer named Kathy sent us this photo of a cow elk just browsing the shelves at a bookstore in Estes Park. Kathy says the elk is somewhat of a regular, comes through at least three times a month. And then this weekend, a few blocks away, Deidre says her bookstore got a visit, possibly from the same animal. I don't know. Maybe they're shopping. Could you just imagine being the person who owns all of the breakable things in that shop and you see that image right there? Apparently they just moved some racks around and the elk left. It was fine. If you see something that says Colorado to you, email it to next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext. Clark Thomas writes in with some inauguration day feedback for me. He says, I noticed that you don't pronounce the T in Mayor Mike Johnston's name. Okay, so here's the deal, Clark. I'm going to try my best on this. Some folks may know. Uh, like 17 years ago or so, I moved to Denver from Rochester, New York, which also has a T in it, but you wouldn't know it from the way that anybody from there says Rochester. You just kind of swallow consonants like they're Zweigel's hot dogs or, or Abbott's ice cream. Uh, Bill writes in, say, you are right about the pronunciation of crayon. Yes. And Laura says, we have this debate in our house all the time. I'm with you. It's crayon. Or crayon, if you're Marshall Zellinger. 